Good evening and welcome to the March 21st, 2019 uh, Planning Commission meeting for the City of Santa Cruz. I'll call the meeting to order and ask for a roll call, please. Commissioner Schifrin? Here. Conway? Here. Bellman? Here. Nielsen? Here. Singleton? Greenberg? Here. Chair Pepping? Present. <clears throat> and Commissioner Singleton has uh, emailed us to let us know he has another event conflicting tonight, so he's absent with notification. Any statements of disqualification for anything on the agenda tonight? Seeing none, any oral communications? Um, we'll invite members of the public to share opinion on agendized items, but this is the time when anyone from the public can share, comment on something, anything that's not on the agenda. Seeing none, we'll uh, move on to approval of minutes. I'll uh, invite a motion to approve the March 7th meeting minutes. So moved. I'll second. I'll Actually, I don't have them in front of me. I think I'm abstaining from. Uh, you were here, but uh, you can still abstain. Uh, no, I think I was um, oh, you stepped conflicted, out. So, yeah, you I, so I'll abstain. Then. OK. All in favor? Aye. 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 With one abstention. Uh, Commissioner Conway abstaining and minutes are approved. Next, we'll move on to a public hearing um, section of the agenda. And item two is amendment of the to the cannabis delivery services regulation. And we have a staff presentation and, and report. Gosh, I have to decide which mic to use. <laughs> Okay, good evening. I'm Catherine Donovan, senior planner in our advanced planning division. And um, we have tonight uh, an item that um, the cannabis delivery services, which is um, brought before us due to a change in state regulations. So the, just a little background. Um, the Prop 64 was approved in November of 2016 and it decriminalized marijuana use in California. Um, and they set out a whole slew of, regulation, of regulations, but left a lot of the details to the state. Um, the city adopted our cannabis ordinance in 2017, it went into effect on December 28th. So it was in effect right before um, it became legal commercially in 2018. Um, and at the time that um, staff was writing the ordinance, city council had directed us to include a limitation on delivery services so that they were not allowed from businesses that were located outside of the city. Um, oops, sorry. They, there were new state regulations um, that are basically uh, fill in where Prop 64 left off um, that went into effect on January 16th and of this year. And um, part of those new regulations, as it just buried in the fine print, um, is a statement that uh, delivery services may deliver in any jurisdiction in the state and that the local jurisdictions have no control. It, the regulation doesn't say that, but local jurisdictions have no control over that. However, um, there's a new bill that's been proposed, AB 1530, that I think it went on the books. It was it was um, sponsored on January 28th, so it's, it's brand new and um, we don't know if it will go into effect, but we're hoping. Um, so when we did this amendment, we, I worked with the city attorney's office and we carefully crafted it so that um, it would uh, allow delivery from locations outside of the city into the city only if required by state law and, and regulation. So that if, this, if AB 1530 should pass, it would automatically not allow delivery services into the city and we wouldn't have to go back and amend, amend it again. Um, so I know sometimes you have trouble with finding the recommendation and reading it. So my, my new method is to give you the recommendation on the, 
on the screen. I don't know, it might be easier to read it from the staff report, but the recommendation is that um, the Planning Commission recommend to the City Council that we um, adopt, approve the resolution adopting the amendment. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Any questions for staff before we invite the public for comments? Mr. Schifrin? Well, I thought I understood the <laughs> staff report until I heard you. Um, the regulations prohibit, the, the state regulations prohibit the city from uh, banning delivery services from outside the city. Right. Correct? But my understanding is they don't prohibit the city from regulating the delivery um, of delivery services within the city. Is that correct? Um, it basically says that uh, delivery, I can actually, I have it bookmarked right here. I can read the section to you. It says, a delivery employee may deliver to any jurisdiction within the state of California, provided that such delivery is conducted in compliance with all delivery provisions of this division. Okay, so. And the delivery provisions are things like, you know, you can't have a marked car and you can only go straight from where you pick it up to where you're dropping it off and then you have to go straight back again and that kind of thing. It, it, there's not any local provisions in there. So I somehow I thought that the ordinance required the um, if a business located, this is on page two of the ordinance, um, if a business located outside of the city delivers to any location inside the city, the business shall obtain a city business license and shall pay all applicable state and local sales and cannabis taxes. So it does allow the city essentially to regulate these businesses by um, requiring them to pay business, to, to register as a business in the city and pay cannabis tax. Right, well those, yes. Those are requirements of any business that does business within the city. Right, so the state regulations don't prohibit that. So, I mean, my understanding was that the purpose of this uh, was really to not disadvantage um, local dispensaries that have to pay taxes. So what it's saying is that if you're a delivery business and you're located outside the city, under state regulations, as long as they stay in effect, you can deliver in the city, but you have to get a business permit and you have to pay taxes, just like any dispensary would. Right. And actually, Technically, we don't need to put that in there. It would still apply because those are regulations of doing business in the city that are in other parts of the um, municipal code. But we put it in here to emphasize that you need to do this. Well, I think it's important to have it in there given the state regulations that seem to say uh, cities can't prohibit delivery services within their boundaries. So a business could think, well, then I can just deliver. Right. So by having this ordinance, I think it makes very clear that yes, as long as the state law provision is on the books, uh, you can deliver, but you have to pay taxes and you have to. Uh, right, and we exact that's exactly why we wrote it this way. We totally agree with you. That's how I understood it, but yeah. from your from what I heard, it wasn't clear that that was uh, in effect. Yes. Um, if I may, I think maybe the confusion came from the fact that since we had started drafting this and having this conversation, um, the uh, new bill was put forth for the legislature that would allow jurisdictions to um, limit deliveries from outside their jurisdiction. And as of right now, the way that our ordinance had previously been written, we would be in support of that. And so that's why the ordinance as written now would kind of let it go both ways so that we wouldn't have to come back and amend it should that, um, what was the AB 1530 um, be adopted. Right. Um, do you know what the status of that bill is? I mean, there are all sorts of bills out there. Yeah. I looked it up today, and it's um, 
I forget the exact wording, but it's basically it's prepared to go to committee, but that it hasn't been submitted to committee yet. So it's got a long road. It's got a long way. Yeah. Um, do you know um, whether the sit, this proposed ordinance is similar to the ordinance that was passed in the county, Santa Cruz County, by the Board of Supervisors? Because as I remember, this, this same issue came before the board, and they passed an ordinance that I thought did the same thing. And I just wondered if there had been any review of the county's ordinance. And you know, I didn't, I didn't check. I know that they were planning to do something similar, but I didn't, I didn't look at, their, at what their ordinance said. They, they've been doing a lot of changes recently and I haven't been able to keep up with it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Other questions for staff? Okay, then we'll invite the public to um, share comments with the commission on this matter. It's a public hearing, so we'll invite, we'll open the public hearing and invite anyone from the public to address us. Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and um, see if commissioners have other questions for staff or discussion or if someone wants staff recommendation. Second. Any discussion? I have one question. I think it's a clerical. I think the clean and red line copy both say Mayor Terrazas. Oh, oh. <laughs> thank you. I will clean that up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, right. And that Templates. Was, you're right. <laughs> and that was my only question. Thank you. Good catch. <laughs> and we'll um, call for a vote. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Catherine. Um, the next, I, one thing I didn't share about the agenda is that um, we had talked to staff about bringing back this matter of um, the brown necked questions with regard to information items versus general business or public hearings and staff was doing some legwork on that wanted to have some additional time to work um, through conversations with the city attorney so that's why you don't see it on here I meant to say that at the beginning so it'll be on a future meeting did you get a date on when that might be no um, I'm likely the next meeting is I would expect it the next meeting um, I would not expect it to stretch out much further than that. It's just a coordinating with the city attorney who's extremely busy. Fine. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Does, so that, sorry, does that mean that we're, uh, that general business four is not happening or? No, that's okay. general business four is still happening. Okay, this was the, have that. This, that was the issue of uh, agendizing something under information items and whether we can no, vote agenda. on that or whether we have to invite public comment on that and separate from whether we have to, we can discuss whether we should, and so all that. Yeah, so we'll still do four. So the next uh, item on the agenda under public hearings is the amendments to the general plan and local coastal plan, and have a, your staff report, and we'll have a presentation on that, I believe. Yes, and um, this is one of our, let's put several things together so we don't have to do so many staff reports. Um, so we have three different things happening here. Um, we have the, uh, the um, bringing the density bonus ordinance into the, our local coastal program. Um, we have the incorporation of the local hazard mitigation plan into the general plan. And we have the update of the general plan archeological and paleontological maps. Um, so we're going to look at the density bonus law and the local coastal program first. Um, <coughs> state density bonus law requires that density bonuses, bonus provisions must be consistent with the California Coastal Act. And um, uh, this has always been true, but there was some question about it which was recently clarified, and I, my bullets are out of order, I'm sorry. It was recently clarified um, in uh, the Colnell Gardens versus City of Los Angeles case, and then after that case, subsequently, um, there was an amendment made by the legislature to the density bonus law, just to sort of reiterate and, and specify more clearly that um, density bonus law had to um, 
be consistent with the California Coastal Act. So in um, density bonus law, you can have allowances that include incentives, waivers, and reduc reductions of development standards in addition to increased density. And those are done in exchange for either increasing the number of affordable units or increasing the level of affordability or some combination of that. Um, the way the local coastal program is um, developed, there are specific sections of the zoning ordinance that are cited in the local coastal program as the implementation regulations of the LCP. Um, the density bonus ordinance is not in that list. And so um, we have been working with Coastal Commission staff on this and they recommend that we bring that specific section that deals with how density bonus and Coastal Act interact into the, the those implementation regulations. Um, and then by adopting that section, it just sort of clarifies um, for everybody exactly how you have to comply with the Coastal Act when you're using a density bonus. Um, and we do have um, some upcoming projects that are in the coastal zone that may be utilizing the density bonus. And so they're, they're programs that, um, you know, if the developer was concerned, having this clarified would help. Um, and they include the Dream Inn project and on the parking lot, um, kitty corner to the Dream Inn, um, the Cypress Points Apartments at 101 Felix, and um, the Jesse Street Project at 314 Jesse Street. And the third item, or I'm sorry, the second item we're, we're bringing for you today is incorporating the local hazard mitigation plan into the general plan. Um, and the reason we are proposing this is that there was a measure, AB 2140, that was approved back in 2006 that allows jurisdictions to be eligible for additional state reimbursement of funds in the event of a declared emergency um, only if their FEMA-approved local hazard mitigation plan is adopted into their safety element of their general plan. Um, and we just recently, uh, the local hazard mitigation plan has to be updated every five years, and ours was just updated. Um, last year, it was um, approved by FEMA in April and adopted by City Council in October. And so by amending, by, uh, amending the general plan to adopt this into the, hazard, uh, the, safety, the safety element, um, then if we do have a declared emergency, we will we'll be eligible for this additional funding. Doesn't mean we'll necessarily get it, but it, we would be eligible to, to apply. And unfortunately, um, we have to do this every five years. They, it, every time it's um, re-approved by FEMA, we have to re-adopt it into our general plan. Hopefully we won't use it in this next five years, but it would be better to be safe than sorry. But the, sorry. And then the third item um, is an update of the general plan archaeological and paleontological maps. And um, in the general plan itself, there is an action that um, states that we will update these maps every five years. Um, and it seems kind of counterintuitive that you'd want to update these historic, you know, maps of historic resources every five years, but as development occurs and reports are done on sites, we get more information. And so incorporating that new information um, with the data that we already have can change the level of review that's required for particular properties. So having those maps updated every five years 
can make a big difference. Um, it helps us protect resources and it also uh, allows us to not require reporting on properties that have basically been cleared. Um, and uh, again, I'm providing you with the recommendations. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Any questions for staff, Commissioner Spellman? I have one on the archaeological maps. Sure. So in general, are we getting um, information that says we're finding more archaeological resources? Uh, we're, we're getting a little, every, a little bit of everything. And, you know, so we're getting um, some positive and some negative, and then some that, uh, you know, there's, there's things found, but they're not significant. So, you know, pieces, broken pieces of bottles from the late 1800s, um, but they're not, they're not considered significant, but you wouldn't want to clear that property because it means that there was something there, there at, at that time. Okay, so no major trends. No major trends, although um, it, was, it was very interesting working with the archaeologists on this because um, they collected all this data um, uh, on the sites. They mapped it. They used a lot of GIS mapping. They mapped the sites. Then they mapped all the different soil types, and they did a lot of analysis about, you know, were there more positive or negative under different soil types, and did the slope matter and the closeness to water. They always, closeness to water is important because you expect people to settle close within a, a reasonable range of water because you're needing the water for daily life. Um, so all of those factors were mapped and um, then they, you know, tried to analyze and, and make some general generalizations based on the where things were found most frequently. And there were certain, certain patterns that were, um, I don't know, I'm, I don't have enough knowledge of the field to say how significant they were, but they seem significant to me that, you know, there were certain soil types where things were found more frequently. And the, the soil maps are, it was like a patchwork quilt. We have a lot of different soil types and they're all scattered all over the place. So um, knowing that, you know, this particular type, which can be found in areas scattered all over, is more likely to have resources, um, kind of did change the pattern that we, that we saw and it changed our mapping slightly. It wasn't, I wouldn't have say it was a significant change, but if your property was on an area of the map that changed, it would be significant for you. Thank you. Other questions for staff? Commissioner Schifrin. Following in your footsteps on the uh, last <laughs> item, I'll uh, point out that it says David Tarasas on this Thank one you. as well. But also on page two of the staff report, uh, there was a, an amusing typo under the discussion of the archaeological maps where it says uh, Dudek also undertook a sophisticated modeling effort which analyzed soil types, sloops, sloops. and distance to water. <laughs> uh, I assume that they weren't analyzing sloops. Um, uh, you know, those ancient boats were very important. <laughs> Um, then I had a question at the last full paragraph where it says the LCP was not included in the 2030 general plan and is currently being revised and updated as a uh, standalone document. I wonder when that, uh, I wanted to ask when that is estimated to come to the Planning Commission. <laughs> um, we are hoping to uh, bring it back either in the um, fall or, you know, it'd be nice if we brought it before the end of the year. Um, unfortunately, it's one of those things that is not urgent. So whenever we get a new load of work that is more urgent, this is the thing that slips. So it's been slipping for a while. What is the consequence of not having it? Does that mean that the, the policies in the new general plan don't apply in the coastal zone? No, it, it's just, it's, it's more a matter of, um, it's just awkward. 
the the we've been we're, we have a draft version of the new document and it's much better organized and easier to use. Um, but in in terms of legality, we're, we're okay. Yeah. So we do have a fully certified. LCP. Um, this update was really intended back when it was started in 2015 to incorporate some sea level rise and hazards policies and do a little cleanup because right now a lot of the policies are tied to the former general plan. And so what we wanted to do is we do have that separated out, but we want to update it with the sea level rise and hazards information with the new general plan policies that we have and then pull in policies from any of our other area plans or specific plans to make it consistent. The exciting part in doing that is that, um, so it's been delayed a bit because there's been staff turnover and new priorities and things that have happened since the inception of that starting in 2015. Uh, end of last year, we did get a grant from the Coastal Commission to add a, an entire um, hazards element, which we don't currently have in the LCP. So um, we're going to be doing this initial update that will come through. Catherine's the project manager on that. Like she said, hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have that here. And then um, by the end of 2020, we expect to have another full update that will come in with the hazards element added, which is really exciting because we don't have that now. And so we're going to be able to use the grant to um, do some really cool community outreach and um, sea level rise studying and modeling that um, will tie into the West Cliff Drive project as well. Okay, so it's a little unclear to me how I, we our LCP has not been revised, but somehow our general plan the, the recently adopted, or not so recent anymore, but the current general plan is consistent with the LCP. So the LCP needs to be consistent with the general plan, not the other way around. Well, they need to be consistent to, with each right. other, right? And so that's what part of this update would be doing. So, but is, are there any consequences of us not being, in terms of the role that the city has in reviewing development in the coastal zone by not having that consistency? No, although I would say that there could be an opportunity for there to be conflicts between policies and we would have to deal with that as they come. Um, typically, our, our current general plan was built on the previous general plan and so um, we're comfortable that we wouldn't have those conflicts. However, there may be some elements that are in the new general plan that weren't in the old general plan. And so our LCP doesn't have those. And so that's why we want to upgrade it and update it to make sure we're capturing everything. So the LCP is really consistent with the old general plan. Yes, sir. And in those areas where the new general plan significantly changes the old general plan policies in the coastal zone, there could be conflicts. There am could I be conflicts. Am I understanding that correctly? There could be conflicts. However, we don't thankfully have any of those and we know that because we've done this analysis and we're working through the process right now. Um, it's just taken us a little longer than we might have hoped. So, but we have done the analysis and we know that there's nothing that's going to be falling through the cracks or any major um, absences, if you will. And this would really, it's mostly to do with sea level rise and hazards, which is what we'll be adding. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions for staff? Then we'll open a public hearing, the public hearing and invite members of the public to address the commission. Uh, invite you to sign in on the right side and uh, state your name if you would when you um, address us. Thanks for being here. And you can have three minutes uh, each on this item. Welcome. Good evening, planning commissioners. And uh, congratulations to you, Mr. Sheffern, for your new appointment. Um, um, I disagree with staff on that. The reason why, and I had three questions and, uh, that I wanted to have a clarity on in this last one here. Um, I, uh, I believe this does affect, I have a, the, the 190 Westcliff project is tearing off the 2030. So they're, they're telling us we don't need, they don't need an EIR for that, that they're going to tear that off the 2030 general plan. Uh, the 20, the, the LCP for that, the only thing that, that uh, Coastal Commission stuff, it's the riverfront. That's the only thing that, that we're even seeing in the local. So I'm, I'm wondering how you can make that statement that you're tearing the project off of 2030 when you don't even have an LCP. The one we have right now is for the 2005. I kind of find that hard to, 
the grass right now, so I don't know why you can actually tear a project off something that's not complete. So I think that LCP is, is important, and it, it has not been. That's one of the questions I'm trying to find out why it's not amended or when it's going to be amended. I haven't been able to get that answer, or from, uh, and uh, actually Coastal Commission, Sarah uh, Carville is, is trying to find an answer for me too, so that my question would be, I believe it is important, but that you can't wait to 2020 unless you think the 190 West Cliff project is not going to come online until 2020. And then the, uh, the second, the first question here, I wanted to be, uh, I expected to hear a little bit more in some of the stuff, so thank goodness I read this. So I just want to make sure that that in this uh, ordinance that we got, that uh, the city ordinance is explicitly stating that the density bonus law does not supersede in any way, alter or lessen the effect of the or application of the, of the California Coastal Act. So that seems to, uh, and I, you know, I've not seen it, this ordinance and stuff like that. So that is going to be in the ordinance, or that's going to be clear. And then. Um, also, another statement, it says the increased density, this is for the density bonuses, it says the increased density itself is not subject to the Coastal Act. However, if the increased density included increased height or decreased setbacks, those physical changes would be subject to the Coastal Act. So that would be in the, that's going to be in the ordinance or the amendment we're making now too. So I guess my question is, the stuff that I pull offline, you have the, that you're talking about stuff like that. Is this stuff going to be put in into the this upcoming amendment that you're doing? Okay. Um, and then I'm trying to understand on page three what this environmental review uh, is actually saying. It's I mean I've, I've done some research, but it's a bit um, wordy for me. So those would be my three questions. That I would hope to get some answers from. If not now, maybe. Later, I'll give you my email address there, and you can put that on there. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Any other comments for the commission? Uh, so we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission to consider um, action on this item. Commissioner Schiffer? Well, um, I think it might be helpful to respond to the testimony just in terms of answering the questions. Um, the my understanding, I don't know the 190 West Cliff, what that project is right now, um, but I think it's important to understand the difference between the California Environmental Quality Act and the general plan law. Tiering is really a concept under the California Environmental Quality Act. So an environmental document can be tiered off an earlier document, but I think the the project has to be consistent with the general plan and the zone uh, and the LCP. So that's really the question that needs to be asked. Is the project consistent with the LC the and it would have to be consistent with the 20 it sounds like the 2005 LCP since the new LCP isn't uh, adopted yet. So uh, when when we're talking about general plans it's about consistency and I think your uh, uh, the ordinance, uh, I found also that the, the information online was a little bit confusing. Usually the staff reports the first <coughs> item, this time it was the last item, and mm. there were a bunch of different, okay, let's blame Tess. Uh, <laughs> but it, there was red line copy, uh, copies, and there were a lot of different um, amend uh, additional information, right? And I, I think it's very helpful to have a red line copy and a clean copy, so I wouldn't want to discourage that. But I think to answer your questions, the, the way you understood it from the staff report, if I understand it, is correct. Um, the only uh, exception to the, that, that can apply for density bonus projects is the density itself. Doesn't the, the setbacks, the height, all have to be consistent with the LCP, uh, and I think the ordinance language does make that uh, does make that clear. That's correct. And uh, in terms of CEQA, um, they're just under CEQA. There are different ways that projects can be amended, uh, can be exempted, uh, categorically exempted, or statutorily exempted. And what the staff is doing is just referring to the particular exemptions that they believe would apply to these amendments. And 
I personally don't have a problem with those. So um, I can see why they're confusing, especially if you don't have the SQL guidelines in front of you. But they, I think the, the sections that they refer to are the particular categories in the guidelines that allow for exemptions for these kinds of projects. So I, um, I don't have any problem with the, uh, with the staff recommendation on these uh, changes. And absent more discussion, I'd be happy to make a motion to approve the staff recommendation. I'd invite a, a motion, and we can discuss under the motion. It's a second. A second. Okay. Any discussion uh, of the motion? Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. So the motion passes unanimously, and we'll close the public hearing section of the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. And now move on to general business, which has one item, the city's public outreach policy. And um, I'm going to continue a conversation we had about this at their last meeting or two meetings ago? I think um, both, yeah. actually. Okay. Um, so I don't have a presentation. I figured we could just have a conversation. Um, so I have had a chance to review the discussions at the previous meetings um, on the community outreach policy and specifically the role of the PC subcommittee. Um, so in the staff report that you've read, we've attempted to clarify the role. I know there were a lot of questions about what the role is, and I can see where there had been some um, potential it's a, it's a very brief policy, and we had had some conversations at previous um, planning commission and council meetings when this was going around the first time last August, but it sounds like we need a little more clarification in the role. So um, in our staff report, we've indicated that a few things. Um, one, that I think it's really important for the commissioners to understand and be mindful of their role and their position of power in, the, in, in these meetings and their, and their stature in, in the meetings as a planning commissioner. And I think any time staff, council members, planning commissioners are out in public, we need to be really mindful of the fact that we are looked at as community leaders and that we can't always wear our uh, independent resident and citizen hat. We often need to be mindful that others view us at, in, the, in these roles. And so I think it, we need to remember that. Um, I think it's really important too that we comment or that the planning commissioners comment uh, at these meetings only on land use policy compliance. If you're going to make any comments at all, um, I don't, you know, there's nothing that says that you have to, but if you're going to, um, I think be mindful in how you're phrasing the comments so that there's not a perception that you've already made a decision. Um, because frankly, should not have already made a decision. You really are there to learn more about the project and to have a, um, a, a dialogue with the developer about things that you may see issues with land use wise, land use policy wise. So general plan, zoning ordinance, any area or specific plans that govern that area, that really should be your focus. Um, Again, I think I said this earlier, but it's stay, abstain from co um, commenting as a community member as much as you can make sure that your comments are coming as representative of the, of the commission. I think that's important. And if there's ever a question of is this right, the answer is probably no. Because um, at all times, I think we need to do our best to be good stewards of the public trust and to avoid any conflict of interest or even an appearance of a conflict of interest is really, really important because there may not be one, but being mindful that things may be perceived that way I think is really, really important. Um, additionally, staff recommends that we avoid having more than three commissioners attending at once. It may not be a Brown Act violation, but again, there's this appearance that it could be. And you know, if more than that do attend, um, definitely do not speak to each other about the project and staff would recommend just not having conversations with one another all together, again, just to avoid any appearance of impropriety because we do want to build and maintain that trust with the community. Um, so at this time, I'd like to recommend that we, I know there was a lot of conversation at the last meeting about do we disband the Planning Commission subcommittee, do we clarify the roles. Staff would like to recommend that um, we go ahead and so this policy is new. There's definitely growing pains. There's definitely um, uh, learning from our mistakes and we're all human and that's okay. I mean, staff could have done a better job of clarifying the role um, 
of the Planning Commission subcommittee when this first came out, and we own that, and that's that's great. But, but let's have the conversation. And so, I think staff recommends that we would um, continue the Planning Commission subcommittee, understanding the roles. We'd be happy to memorialize this in writing or in some sort of like addendum to the policy, if if the commission would like to ask us to do that. And I'd like to have a conversation with you about if you do choose to move forward in that way and give, give that a, a little more of a chance now that it's a little more fleshed out, see if it works for a trial period. If it doesn't, maybe you wanna revisit that and we can talk about how to revisit that. But if you do wanna move forward with the commission, uh, Planning Commission Subcommittee as it is, we'd like to talk to you about um, Noting role, let's see here, staff recommends the commission discuss the best way they'd like to be introduced at community meetings. I think we heard a recommendation about name tags. That's a wonderful idea. I think that's a great idea and we should all have, um, it came in as a community comment, I believe that we should, uh, commissioners and staff should have name tags and be identified. So how do we introduce you? How can staff do a better job of introducing ourselves? Be clearer about the roles of each of the different parties at the meetings. Um, and um, how you can best provide any early feedback or questions regarding policy or code compliance, um, and then um, how you can bring your first-hand account of the community meetings back to the full commission. So that's the recommendation. I'm here to answer any questions and obviously discuss amongst yourselves. Thank you. I have one question sure. to, um, that might inform us as we, as we discuss it. How many of these meetings have we had? That's a really great question. Yeah, the community meetings? Mm -hmm. I don't know offhand because I focus on the long range planning team. Off the top of my head, I'd say it's between three and five. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So. Yeah, knowing how many projects we have, um, development projects. And then there was also one, uh, are we including the ADU meeting? I know Commissioner Smellman, uh, you were at that meeting. I think they were bringing up the five. Yeah, yeah. Between okay. development meetings and policy meetings. Thank you. Yep. Um, so we we um, we have a recommendation from you, and if if we were to amend, like have an addendum to the policy, that's just to guide ourselves. It mm -hmm. doesn't go to council, right? N not as I understand it. I believe that we could just do an addendum internally. If you wanted to fully strike something from the <laughs> ordinance, how or the um, the, the policy, um, or make significant changes. Uh, I, since it is a council adopted policy, I would expect that it would need to go back to council for those significant changes. But a clarifying addendum, I think is suitable to do internally. Okay, I just wanna make sure we're defining the work. So absent that, we're talking about guidance and clarification for our own selves um, and for the benefit of the public. So it's a general business item and we'll invite um, members of the public to give comment. But before that, if people have questions or for staff or comment, we can do that too. Um, I have a lot of comments, um, but maybe it would make sense to hear from the public first. Hold it for, okay. Anybody else before public comment? Jim? I just had a quick question. Mm -hmm. So in terms of what community meetings means, it's both meetings about development, uh, develop particular developments, as well as policy meetings like the ADU meeting. Is there anything else that a community meeting means? N not necessarily one that's sponsored by the city. So different community groups may have a community meeting on various in, uh, initiatives or issues that they feel of, that's important. But under the community outreach policy, the way that we are looking at them, so the way our department's broken up is we have a long range planning team, we have a, a development review or current planning team, and then there's the building department and code enforcement teams. Typically they're not gonna have any much community outreach because a lot of their work happens after a project's been approved approved for the land use entitlement and they deal with the actual development of the buildings. The current planning and long range planning teams are the ones who are making the policy, that's my team, and then implementing the policy through the, the zoning ordinance is the uh, like Eric Marlett's team, the current planning team. So we're the ones who are gonna be out in the community most often saying, hey, here's what's coming forward, be it a change to the zoning ordinance, be it a change to the general plan, be it any sort of amendments. And then his team saying, here's a new development that's coming in in your community. We want to talk about it. That's usually where you see our community meetings. Mm. And so you go to different community meetings, your two committees? Um, yes, because it, it really just depends. Um, they more often will come to the, the current planning team, more often will come to ours uh, than the long range planning team going to theirs because we set and create the policy that they then implement through the design review process. 
Mm -hmm. And so um, often we'll have them participate as we're mm -hmm. helping craft the policy to make sure it's going to work on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not that often that a policy individual like someone from my team mm -hmm. would go to a current planning uh, meeting unless it was just of interest. Um, or, or if we were talking about a major, major change to one of our policy documents because of a project mm -hmm. request, that's when we might attend. But it's not, mm -hmm. it's not a standard operating procedure to do it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for instance, the ADU meeting, all of you went to that. Yes. But the Dream In meeting, just the current folks. You got it. Okay. You got it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mr. Shepard. Clarify, because the mm -hmm. policy that we're talking about is a very specific policy. It's attachment mm -hmm. one, and it says community outreach policy for planning projects. So mm -hmm. it's not for policies. There can be all sorts of community meetings for policies, and I would say mm -hmm. you meetings are policy meetings, but mm. this this, right. That um, actually is not correct. It does say that, but we very intentionally wrote it that way to cover both. So it doesn't say, it says planning projects. Projects meaning either a amendment project, a zoning ordinance update project. We view those as, we call those projects, but they're not development projects, they're policy projects. So if you read a little further in the ordinance, we do refer both to policy as well as to um, development review. Well, it certainly does have a section on small, small development project, medium development project, large development project, significant project, any proposal regardless of type that has the potential for significant citywide interest. So is right. that what your, your meaning as policy? Yes, and I believe if I remember correctly, and I'll, I'll have to pull it up here, sometimes my computer's a little slow, but near the back we do talk about policy. And it's not on the last page. Um, let me see if I can find it while you guys continue to your conversation. but. There definitely um, are references to policy in there because we wanted this. Other topics, there you go. Long range planning project. Yes, and so we did want this to cover everything. So when we say project at the beginning, we are referring to to both types. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions or discussion before we get comment from the public? So we'll open the public hearing and invite members of the public to sign in on the right, if you would, and uh, state your name if you're willing and. I have three minutes to address the commission. Hi, Thank you. Sh Shelly Hatch. I had a question because you just mentioned design review. What is there a design review committee? That's what I've been trying to find out for a few meetings here. You just mentioned design review. In what context did you mention it? Usually not back and forth during public comment. Okay, so we can I'll sit down. Thank is, you. Is that your only comment? Yes. And try to bring that up in our discussion. Any other members of the public? Welcome. By the way, again, I just wanted, uh, Andy was talking about it. I thought one of the things we were trying to accomplish here is that when we have these large uh, projects that are coming out that are required community meetings, that, that, that we'd have, a, we'd have a planning commissioners there and a team of three people so they can answer some policy and stuff like that. So I thought that was one of the main things of the purpose of this committee that we're going to do. That, that, that it is really guided a lot for so this city's going to have an enormous amount of big projects coming up in the next five years. So that's what I thought the intent of this was, was to, was to have a, a committee of three commissioners to answer uh, some of the questions that the community might want or some stuff on policy. I mean, uh, is, that not, is that not what this, the committee we're talking about? Is that not part of the, de part of the deal? I'll, um, do you have any other comments? I don't want to use more of your no, no, that's, three I just, minutes. I just, I just, I didn't, I didn't hear anything, and then Andy was the one that kind of got on it. I no, you're, like, wow. you're right. Okay. It's, um, but there's been some question about whether it's, um, um, whether it's consistent with other city policy and whether we have concerns with the Brown Act. So yeah. we're, you're right, and we're revisiting it to make sure we don't need to refine it or change it or end it or something like that. Okay, I just kept hearing that we we're talking more about policies internally between staff people and, and that kind of stuff. No, you're like, right. I thought we were leaving out that part. Okay, yep. thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you both, and uh, we'll close the public hearing and bring the matter back to the commission for discussion on how we're going to guide ourselves and clarify this for the, for the community. Commissioner Schifrin? I think it's useful to get the clarification between policy community meetings and project community meetings, because I think that they're really fundamentally different because the commission plays a fundamentally different role in those two uh, 
um, in, in those two areas. In the policy area, the commission, you know, the, the role of the commission is to recommend general plan and zoning ordinance policies. They come before us, um, and that, that's what the commission does. And in deciding how, what those policies should be, having, going to community meetings, listening to community about that is, seems legitimate to me to do that. That could help in the development of policy. When it comes to projects, the commission plays a very different role. We're really, like the city council, we're really judges. And I think the, you know, the first part of the staff presentation sort of, uh, I would agree with. The commissioners being at these meetings are, are not like everybody else. They're in a, a more, we're in a more powerful position. And like a judge, we are, our job is to interpret the general plan policies inter or, and the zoning ordinance and to review applications once we have all the information and determine whether they're consistent, do they need conditions to be consistent or whether they're inconsistent. We're, we're acting, as I said, like judges. Um, the, I don't think it's the commissioner's job to explain the city's land use policies to developers. That's fine for, that's, I see that as a staff job because our job is when we, when we get a, an application before us, we have to make a decision on it. We take the staff recommendation, the staff analysis, we hear from the public, we hear from the applicant, and then we make our exercise or independent judgment in terms of uh, is that application consistent with the general plan and the zoning ordinance. That's what we're supposed to be doing. It's not the planning commission's role to either assist developers or to discourage developers. That's not our job. There may be city policies to encourage development. That's fine. Um, there may be, uh, and certainly there's a desire for um, the people in the community both to support development and to not support development. Our job I see it as really waiting till a project gets in front of us and then determining whether it meets the requirements. Under, you know, the federal constitution, developers, unlike with adopting policies, developers have due process rights and they have equal protection <coughs> rights. Um, and we have to be very cognizant of those rights and the, our, Activities can be challenged, the city's decisions can be challenged if a developer can argue that their due process rights were violated or the public can argue it or that there's equal protection. So how does this play out at these community meetings? Well, I don't see how a, a commissioners can speak at those meetings and not be taken as if this is influential. I was thinking as it, in some ways, as we've learned over the years, body language is very important. If I'm a developer, I wanna reduce my risk as I go through this process. So it's important to hear from the public to see if there's things that I can do to make my project a little bit more acceptable. But I'm looking at the decision makers. What are they, what message are they sending me about their potential willingness to uh, support my project? And comments that are made by commissioners, eye rolling responses, uh, body language from commissioners can influence what a developer, a message that a developer gets about whether the, what, it, what he or she needs to do to develop the project. The other side of it is what is the message that community members get? And in situations where um, projects are contentious, um, both sides are looking for ways to kind of justify their position. And being able to uh, attack um, the commissioners or the commission because there's bias. We know that the you know, that's a, uh, a complaint that's sometimes made about, about staff. And I'm just afraid that if we're commissioners are part of the dog and pony show that goes on at a community meeting, when that project ultimately comes before the commission, there's gonna be the perception, and 
I don't think it has anything to do with the reality necessarily, but it certainly can um, be the perception that the there that that bias is being uh, that the bias is being laid out. So from my perspective, um, I think it's fine. I think it's important that I, well, I think it's certainly I don't object to the policy of having community meetings. I think they can be useful for developers. They can be useful for uh, for the public, they can be even useful for staff, and I don't really object to commissioners going to them and sort of listening to what the public has to say and listening to what the developer has to say. I just don't think the commissioner should be there in an official capacity. They should be there, they should listen, they should keep, we should keep our mouths shut. Um, at least that would be my advice and what I would do if I would go. It's a place for us to listen and learn. It's not a place for us to stop playing our role as decision makers. And any time we open our mouths as decision makers, that's the danger of uh, how that, whatever that comment is. Um, so from my perspective, um, I don't, I don't think it's enough to, I don't think we need to tweak this policy. I think um, w from my perspective, and I'm prepared after we have some discussion to make a motion that we request the council to rescind this portion of uh, the, the policy because one, it's somewhat inconsistent with our bylaws in terms of when the commission uh, is legitimately acting on projects. And I think it just really muddies the role of the commission in terms of the um, information that members of the public and uh, developers will, will get from the commissioners, commission participation in these community meetings. Commissioner Schifrin, so you want to keep the policy but rescind the part that has commissioners participating? Yes, and I would, I, I think that what I would suggest is uh, recommending that that provision be, um, that provision of the community outreach policy be rescinded, but that we agree that commissioners can, if they wish, uh, attend the community meetings uh, as members of the general public to hear what goes on. So that if commissioners want to know what's, what, want to learn about the project, they can learn about the project but not in any official capacity that can be misunderstood. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Conway. I'll go. <clears throat> uh, I agree with quite a few of your points. Um, however, um, I disagree with your main point about rescinding uh, this action. I wasn't in favor of it um, initially for many of the reasons that you listed. And then, of course, we had an example at an early meeting where um, a commissioner really behaved inappropriately and has apologized. Um, it does shine a light on sort of the perils of, um, of exactly the points that were made about body language and, and um, what, is, what is really the role. It's very important to be clear. So this role came out of the housing blueprint, that long, you know, really arduous process of dialogue in which the city engaged with the community, um, looking for ways to um, really provide a blueprint to have better communication. Um, as I said, I was, I was a, somewhat dubious about it when it came out, but um, besides that it came out of that process that was very involved, it involved a lot of community members, um, it was in response, and it, do, it doesn't exactly respond, but there's long been a desire for a design review committee, which of course it isn't, um, but the opportunity to have earlier input um, was, was one of the main points that came out of it. But the biggest argument for keeping it is that absent that one misbehavior, um, I think this has been pretty successful. Um, the intent was to help build a bridge um, with the community, to have the community have an opportunity to be present, have some meaningful, weighing in more meaningfully than the formal developer meeting um, that you know is going to happen later on in the process. Um, I think that um, there was a request to have planning commissioners there, and we've you know commissioners have been willing to provide their time, fortunately, someone who has actually valid opinions about design, um, because it, this is the time to hear um, how, how they weigh in. So um, 
I have changed my mind on this committee. Um, I think that, or this subcommittee rather, I think it has an important role. I think decorum cannot be overemphasized. Um, and the formality of the role um, when you walk in, I mean, it's true, our, our actual opinions only count when we're voting on something as a whole group when we're sitting here. But our perceived opinions when we're out in the community are really important. So I think name tags are important. I think a formal introduction is important. Um, and I think an emphasis on the, that we are not there in our quasi-judicial role. We are there to listen and to actually listen and overhear how the community is interacting with a project or an important policy at a point before it is a vote. Um, that was, it came out of a process. I support it continuing. Commissioner Nielsen, and then uh, Commissioner Greenberg. Um, I, I, um, I, I feel like the, the number one thing that was the most important that came out of, um, out of this, um, out of this piece coming together was the community involvement piece and the fact that um, that for projects that developers were proposing that they that the community they could have a meeting and the community could come and look at the project before it's been submitted and provide feedback um, on that um, and I've been to a few of these meetings as a as part of the subcommittee um, and and I've seen that they are they've I think they've worked really well in that in that capacity for community involvement. I think the area where it gets where it's kind of it's this muddy area for me as being on the subcommittee, also as being an architect and having um, my own opinions about things. Um, I've been in those meetings. I do. I, you know, I haven't. I, I I've said very little in those meetings just be, because of because of basically what Commissioner Shipram was saying. Um, so I'm curious, or that's kind of a question of mine, is um, uh, in ter if the developer is, is, is opening up this project to the community, and I think the hope is, is that the developer is then getting feedback so that they can move the project along in the way that the community would like it to happen how, can, as a subcommittee member, can we provide any direction in terms of a recommendation on how to make an adjustment to the project in some way? I see that being, I, I get concerned about that because if, because then, then if those, if, 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 if those changes are made, then it's, it's almost as if it's, you know, it's intended that it will um, it will pass because those uh, because those changes are made. So that's where it, I, I'm I do have concern about it, and so I don't really know what the answer is for that. Um, but it is a question, and I um, and I think it's I think it's worthwhile to figure that out um, because we've had plenty of projects that have not gone through a public process or. Uh, 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 do a community meeting and and have been submitted and come before us that uh, that could could have used some changes and sometimes being at you know on this side and 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 seeing those projects there's a there's a huge benefit to to a project potentially and but sometimes it's it's, it, may, it might be off a little bit, but the the benefit of uh, of the of the greater benefit of the project, you know, just the you know, it's better to to accept that project even though it has some flaws because of the greater the greater good of it. So that to me is like that's the time is before it's actually submitted. Those are the times when we can make some make changes or or not we make changes, but propose or recommend modifications, but I don't know if that's appropriate or not, but it seems like that's a better time to do it than to deny a project uh, and have them, you know, start over. So um, that's a question, that's really kind of a question that I have. Um, I think, um, I think it's important, I, I, I really think, I mean, 
you know, obviously from the development side, developers are looking for those answers. You know, how how can they you know get a project to be accepted? And that's um, as well. I mean, and then on the flip side, the community is really wants to understand a project and be able to provide input for that. And so I think it's a, I think having these meetings is is critical, and I think it's a great thing that is happening. And um, but just in terms of the role of the of the subcommittee and from a um, design review or a feedback uh, or recommendation standpoint, um, I'm not I'm not sure about. And those are just questions that I'm discuss. Um, I think that's um, that's that's what I wanted to add. Commissioner Greenberg. Um, yeah. So. Thanks, everyone, and this is really a um, very stimulating discussion on this issue, um, and I have a few questions. I guess a central question that was for me at the last time and this time as well, once I discovered that, you know, the different staff committees are already present at these meetings, um, at least the current, you know, uh, projects committee and sometimes the long-range projects committee, is what kind of added value there is of having the commissioners there, if the staff is already there, to answer, you know, a lot of the kinds of questions that you enumerate um, as, you know, uh, the seven types of issues that might arise, um, methods to foster more neighborhood involvement at early project phases to, uh, and to provide direction to staff applicants and the public regarding, you know, th these seven issues. Those are issues that it seems like the staff could speak to. Um, and so I guess a question is, is what the added value is. And insofar as, as Julie's saying, um, you know, the community through this process was actually requesting that commissioners be there. Like why were they requesting commissioners and not solely staff be there is a question. Um, that, that's one question I have. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to jump in. And again, yeah. I wasn't the big advocate for this um, policy. I've kind of come around. Um, at the time, it was thought that um, our meetings here are very formal. We do not have an opportunity to hear, on, hear um, aside for, from three-minute slices. And it was an opportunity, as I understood it, mm -hmm. for planning commissioners to listen Listen. And um, I don't think that it is appropriate because it's not a design review committee, and um, you know, which is a, another very key point. That was a, something that had been proposed um, as part of the zoning update, um, and it never that ne never ended up coming across. But it was something that was definitely found, and we continue to hear about the need. Mm -hmm. This is not a design review committee. Um, I do think, though, that the questions of design, and I, and I'm always very glad that we have um, you know, our architects participating in this committee, not to provide direction. I personally don't think it's appropriate at that point to be in any way providing um, direction. I think it's to be he's seeing how the community is responding. One of those points is about design. Um, we know that um, our professional architects are gonna be seeing many things in proposed designs at early stages that are worthy of feedback. In my mind, the appropriate um, place for those questions and feedback would actually be to go to staff because staff is working directly with a developer um, to move a project along to the point at which you know, the developer wants to build it and the staff believes it's something that could be supported um, by, by policies um, of the city. Um, but it's at that point that we are appointed for the purpose of listening to and adjudicating those responses. So I think an early input from a trained eye um, who's not the project architect, I think it's always good to have um, that additional input. But I don't think that that's, I don't think it's a dialogue out there. I don't think that, that that's a place um, that that belongs. I don't know if that answered your question or not. Um, value added, I think the, the real value added is in listening to the community's response to a project um, and um, at, at an earlier stage. It seems to be helping to build some bridges um, from what I've been hearing about most of the meetings. Um, and um, and that's, an, that's an important, it, it's important to, 
for the community to know that they're being heard at a time other than when there's going to be a vote. Mm -hmm. So then um, the part of the ordinance that talks about feedback would not be something that you would support. It's more, it's really, you, you're seeing the benefit of this um, to the degree that there is benefit as being listening, listening. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's a good clarification. Um, so, um, which I hear, and I also hear um, Commissioner Schifrin's concern that there's, you know, even when we're listening, like, and you can see, I have a hard time with body language myself in, in, in my family. I'm like nodding and I can move around. Um, so it's, you know, and some of us would have to kind of like, you know, be, be careful about that. But there can be um, perception of, you know, encouragement and it can put, it can make it awkward potentially for people on the subcommittee to know. And you can be, you know, as an architect, it can be like, it can be um, a little stressful maybe, like if you really want to um, engage, but you feel like perhaps that would not be appropriate and so forth. And so it can put people in an awkward position so I see that there's um, maybe undue complexities here. Um, the design review committee, I've been hearing at previous meetings, people's interest in that. If that were to be created, um, who would be on that committee? How would, what role would commissioners play on that committee? I think that, that would, uh, that's not a decision or determination that could be made now. I think we would, mm -hmm. staff would, uh, look for direction from council mm -hmm. on what that would look like. Um, yeah, so it's really hard to say okay. how, if at all, moving forward. And I know there's different um, interest in that moving forward on some sides and not moving forward on other sides. At least historically, we have a new council, we have new members on the planning commission, we live in an ever-changing and evolving <laughs> world. Right. But um, yeah, the yep. uh, it's hard to say. Council would have to provide that direction. Right. Mr. Spellman. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of models out there too for mm. other municipalities and how, you know, the ones that do have a design review process, who's on it, not always uh, staff and planning commission. It could be just professionals from certain areas. So there's mm. kind of a hybrid of things. Um, when redevelopment agencies were in the mix, they, you know, some of them were directing, you know, design direction for, you know, most projects that were going through. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of different ways to do it and it's mm -hmm. more about, what's right for this community and, mm -hmm. and types of projects we'd be reviewing mm -hmm. could be very different. I would expect it to have some staff and s probably some planning commission, but probably that's a small percentage of the larger design review committee. Yeah, in previous jurisdictions um, or organizations that I've been in, um, it has typically been uh, noted experts from the outside who come in um, and look with usually a staff support but again, as uh, Vice Chair Spellman said, it could take a number of forms. Okay. Um, so those were some questions that I had. And, um, you know, wondering about, insofar as the community was requesting this, what they were hoping would be the result, really, of our participation in some kind of formal way. Yeah, yeah I, I think that Commissioner Conway really summed it up. It was it was really about Listen, the listening. Just listening. And yeah. so that was part of the point that I was uh, attempting to make at the introduction here mm -hmm. is that if co comments are not required to be made by, by the subcommittee mm -hmm. when they're attending, however, if they are made, they really need to stick to land use. They really need to. So what would be helpful if commissioners do want to be able to provide comments in that setting is, you know, bone up on your on your uh, policies out of the different plans and on, out of the zoning ordinance. And, you know, before you go, I know because we all have infinite time, right? <laughs> but, you know, take an opportunity to, to look, okay, what, what are the requirements and what are the s uh, specifics and the policies that govern this area so that when I go, I can be prepared to um, ask those questions if I see issues. Um, I guess the final point just, uh, so that makes total sense to me. And initially I had thought we should just strike the language in there that I, completely about feedback sure. and just focus on listening. At the same time that I'm a bit concerned about the points that are raised um, by Commissioner Schifrin that there could be the perception of bias or uh, somehow a developer could perceive that their due process or equal protection rights were somehow being violated if someone were there 
if someone were not there, you know, at this meeting, um, and they weren't getting the hearing that they thought they deserved to get, and it had some bearing on our decision. Um, and, you know, so this quasi-judicial, as opposed to policy-related meetings where we wouldn't be so constrained. So I'll put that up there. Commissioner Spelling? Yeah, so there, there's been a lot of really good points made. Um, I think it does start to get a little muddy when we talk about design, right? These, these are really design review meetings, yeah. right? That's what they are. So that we were calling them community outreach meetings, but there's a set of drawings, usually three-dimensional and rendered, and there's discussion around those drawings. So it's, it's hard to step back, right, and not see them as that. Um, so I think there, there does need to be the discussion about design review committee that's a different thing. You would still have these community meetings, right, as an addition to a design review meeting if it were, you know, if the project were worthy of that type of level of review. Um, so that wouldn't, that wouldn't change. Um, you know, I, I, the two meetings, three meetings that I've been to, I've made two very minor comments, but I think they were um, kind of community-focused and, and clarification type of comments, right? So for example, on the G Street project, you know, this thing is a, is a small ownership project and under the current zoning code, that is the only unit type that can go into this project. But the community was having a really hard time figuring out why, why are they just all one bedroom units, mm -hmm. right? 300 and three or whatever the number is, one bedroom units. And nobody said, that's a choice, right? That's the developer's choice. It's not that the zoning code says that's all you can put there. They've chosen that type of project to you know, put forward for this, this project. It could be a multifamily mixed use project as well, right? Which would have a mix of uses, but this project has those set of rules. And the answer is that staff was giving were kind of confirming that yes, that's all you can do is the one bedroom unit. And I don't think it was clear at all to the public that you could do a lot of different things, but this type of project could only do that. So I think, and that was the one, one comment I made. I mean, I think those, that's kind of an unusual case. Um, could staff have made that comment? You know, staff could have made that clarifying point, but sometimes it just doesn't come out. Um, so, you know, I think there's a benefit to that type of relationship there. Yes, I think the design critique and processing, looking at images and, you know, making comments then is completely inappropriate. And you certainly would get into the realm of um, um, seeming to favor a project, I think, going, going down that road, which would be probably the, definitely the wrong uh, types of things to make. The other thing I would say is, so I think we're learning about commissioners' roles, and I think we're honing in on what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. Maybe that's going to continue. I, for one, am in favor of continuing to allow that process with these new kind of rules and guidelines that communicate to people attending what our roles are. You know, we're still in an official capacity here. We're not community members, per se, you know, just here to see what's going on. We're listening to the community on this specific project and maybe we will you know have the opportunity to make very broad land use types of statements uh, about a project i would encourage that to continue i do think we need to also address the public's perception of what the purpose of these meetings are as well there's some there's been some very good correspondence given to us that says you know why isn't the developer there Right? So I don't know that we can require the developer to be there, but we should certainly encourage the developer to be in attendance so that appropriate questions to them could be addressed at those moments. Um, and the format of you know, question and answer, uh, which was kind of missing. I didn't go to the 190 Westcliff meeting and, and participate in that, but that seemed like a very frustrating meeting for the public to not be able to weigh in on, on things in a, in a way that made sense, right? It was a community outreach meeting. It, they don't want to be lectured to. It should be a dialogue and an ability to, you know, ask the questions. Um, so I think we need to fine tune that piece. And if, you know, this, 
the language could be fine-tuned to encourage those things, talk about the Q&A very directly, and even summarize those points you know, at the beginning of these meetings so people know when it's appropriate and how that would play out, I think would be uh, as important as trying to figure out what our role really is and where it fits best. Yeah, if I may, um, I, I think you make some really good points about on the staff end, uh, lessons learned and things that we could do better on this end. Again, it's a new process. Uh, we're all learning <coughs> the best way to make this work. I wasn't at that m meeting either, but I definitely read the correspondence that came through and many good points were made. And so I think that it's a really good opportunity for us to, now that this has been in effect for about six months or so, to say, okay, what's working, what's not, take a step back, reassess and if the commission does decide to move forward with some of these uh, uh, amendments or uh, not amendments addendums to the policy then well or if you choose to do amendment you can do that too but uh it changes to the policy um to that should also be done on the staff end too to make sure that we're making these as valuable as possible because at the end of the day it truly is about getting meaningful community input very early in the process to make the project the best project it can be Mr. Schiffrin. Have any of these projects come before the commission? Uh, the ADU, I de I, see, I know, I know my bubble. <laughs> well, I'm, the not, ADU, I'm talking about projects, I'm not talking about policies. Yeah, so the development yeah. projects, I don't believe anything has come through so yet. So to be able to say that the public um, is happy with this process is a bit premature and that the commission won't be criticized for being at these meetings is a bit premature. Um, I don't think it's possible in this community to talk about the community. There are lots of communities and they don't all agree and many of them disagree very strongly with each other. And um, my sense is the two projects that you've talked about, although I haven't been to any of the community meetings from reading material in the paper, these are controversial projects. There are gonna be people who want them and there are gonna be people who don't want them. And my sense is, although I haven't sat up here, is that it is not unusual for members of the public to perceive bias on the part of a commission that votes for every project uh, that comes along, as this commission has, um, at least every big project that I'm aware of. So I think, you, I think going forward with this, um, policy with the best intentions is ignoring the context in which development moves forward in this community. I think, um, Commissioner Nielsen, the points you raise are really, were really critical points. What, you, you know, you do have, you're an architect, you do have ideas about what would improve this project. And the question is, is, you know, to go to a community meeting where you're, you know, you would like to, uh, make those views known and you can't is frustrating. But I would argue that that's not your role. What I would say is when that project comes before the commission, if you feel that the, um, that the design is inadequate, it, it, doesn't, it isn't necessary to, to vote no. It can say go back and redesign it. That's, there's nothing new in that. Um, it's, it's the, at least in my experience, Planning commissions look at projects, they have problems with projects, they take the public input in, and then maybe they want to do a major redesign and they'll send it back. Trying to sort of work it all out in advance, um, I just think is a real slippery slope and creates real problems, it's gonna create real problems down the road. Um, and my sense is listening is fine and I'm perfectly happy as listening, but I think if we're there, you know, if uh, commissioners are there in a formal role, they're not simply there listening. They're part of the review process, and what their being there is going to be taken in a particular way um, in the context in which these projects move forward. So I think it's very, um, I'll be interested to see what happens when, when I, if it ever gets here, if 190 comes before the commission, if 350 Ocean Street comes to co before the commission, and what mem different members of the public are gonna say about the fact that uh, commissioners were part of these community meetings uh, to, to the extent that they participated. 
It's interesting, Commissioner Spellman. I, as someone who, just sort of putting myself in the role of somebody who was opposed to the project, where you made sort of a clarifying, clarifying comment about what the policies are, what the what the choices of the uh, developer were. Are you helping the developer? Am I going to see you as helping the developer? You're not wanting me to see it that way, but if I'm worried about previous votes that you've made, what your attitude might be, is that how am I going to misperceive what you do? And that's what I think is really the underlying problem here. It's not that it wouldn't be beneficial to have input and it wouldn't be that or that any of the commissioners are acting in bad faith. I don't think any of that is the problem. I just think the problem is that in a contentious political planning environment, to have commissioners early on providing comments or even being there as commissioners with the staff for the, you know, at a developer called meeting, it just raises that notion that there is a bias that the commission is going to play out when the policy gets before the commission. Some people will say, fine, they, they like having the commissioner there, they want to hear what you have to say. Um, others will say, wait a minute, um, this is really not their job. And I think really it is the staff job to answer the land use policy. I'm mm -hmm. disturbed that um, the, uh, the notion that staff should bone up on, I mean the commission should bone up on land use policies so they should be able to come to the, these community meetings and tell members of the public what the land use policies are. That's not our job. That's the staff's job either at the meeting or in private meetings with the developer, these are the policies that you have to meet. Mm -hmm. Our job is to decide when that project comes before the commission, whether it is consistent with the general plan and the zoning ordinance. That's our job. And I don't know, I, I feel it's a mistake to um, have this kind of, of official function where we're out there at a community meeting in a sense, assisting the development process. And that's how it's gonna be looked. We're assisting this development going through the process. The whole purpose of the community meeting is to make the project better. Well, that's not our job to make the project better. It's not our job to make the project worse. <laughs> it's our job to figure out, is the project consistent with the general plan or the zone and the zoning ordinance? If it is, we should support it. If it isn't, we shouldn't. It's a confusion if we're going to community meetings where their, their purpose is to help developers develop a better project. Um, I think having a community meetings to help developer develop a better project is fine. It makes sense. It makes sense for the community to see what developers have, on, have in mind. But it's not our job. Mm -hmm. That's why I just feel that this is a... Um, it, this, is, this is just not a good role for the commission to play. Mr. Conway. Um, I just had a question of clarification. Are these meetings not city-sponsored meetings as opposed to the developer-sponsored meetings? Did I get that wrong? Um, so the way that it, it typically, okay, so it's, it's kind of a hybrid. So what it is is that the developer sponsors it, they send out the mailings, but staff is there. And to Commissioner Schifrin's point, yes, staff's role is absolutely to, at the beginning, make the introduction, welcome everybody, welcome everybody give a high-level here's what the project is, here's what the zoning allows, here's what the, you know, give the overview and then allow that developer to give the presentation and take the questions from the community on any number of things. Um, I do want to clarify, however, that it wasn't my intent if I did come across as saying that um, it was the commissioner's roles to explain the land use policy. That is not, that was not my intent. Um, so uh, I, I apologize if it came across that way. What I meant is that it, should you want to, uh, ask questions and be an interactive part of that conversation. It may be helpful to know those policies so that if you, because there's a vast array between the general plan, all of the different elements and sections in the general plan, the zoning ordinance, any specific area or specific plans, there's a lot of nuance to these things. And so that may be helpful if you want to have those conversations. But by no means did I mean that um, you would, as commissioners, be providing that type of guidance. That definitely would come from staff. Did you get your question answered? Mr. Conway. Oh, yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Yeah, I'm um, not sure I understood the answer completely. So it, well, it, it is, <laughs> sure. it's a requirement for the project to have the meeting, whether it's you know mailed by the developer, it's a certain project of a certain size. It depends on the, well, that's right. It depends on the size and scale of the project. And the, yes, but, but what I understood is that this is not the required by ordinance developer sponsored meeting that generally happens when a project is you know fairly baked. Yes, and just uh, before it comes before. Yes, and it again, in it depends in the ordinance on what kind of project gets what kind of meeting. This is additional on top of that. Right, the intent of this right. is to make it an even more um, intense opportunity for a community, maybe that's not the right word, but to ensure that early and as often as possible the community has an opportunity to provide feedback, both as a benefit and certainty for the public so that they know early, hey, a project may be coming, I might wanna be involved with this, we'll put a sign out there, we'll let you know, well before the public hearing that this is coming, as well as certainty for the developer that they are going to get community feedback and hear from the community if something is glaringly wrong or glaringly unacceptable to the community so that before they get halfway down the pike and learn that, then they have to go back to the drawing board. So it's it, the intent is certainty on both ends. Commissioner Schiffrin. I, I just can, wanted to follow up on. Can, can we just, I wanna, ask all commissioners to keep the conversation on, um, pointed towards uh, potential action on this. Okay, I'm very happy to do that. Thanks. And we'll end my, my uh, response with, uh, with an action, proposed action. But I, I, Commissioner Spellman asked whether these meetings were required. And I think that's a good, a good question. I had that question last time w this came up. And it's, it's required by a council policy uh, but the council policy is not legally, a developer doesn't legally have to follow it. It's not in the ordinance. It's not an official part of the process. So if a developer says, forget about it, I'm not doing this, um, you know, that people will say, hey, we didn't come, we didn't follow the, you know, people will be upset with that perhaps, but there's no legal um, problem for him to do mm -hmm. or, or her to do that. So in, from that sense, it's really not required. It's felt that it's a good thing. And I think it is a good thing um, to have it. And uh, as I said, I think it's a good thing for commissioners to be there to listen. I don't think it's a good thing for the commission to be there, commissioners to be there officially as part of a, uh, a, a and this is what just struck me at this discussion, is part of a process that is helping the developer c come up with a project that's more likely to be uh, approved. So I would make a motion that the Planning Commission recommend to the City Council that they rescind the provisions of the Community Outreach Policy establishing the Planning Commission subcommittee and further that the Commission agree that any Commissioner can attend a community meeting as a non-participating member of the public. That's my motion. Is there a second? I'll second that. Discussion, Commissioner Spellman? Yeah, I mean, I, I would tend to support that concept. I think, uh, you know, this is about the community outreach. This isn't about uh, the commissioners having an opportunity to do anything. If it takes the heat off the public's perception that if a commissioner wants to attend as a community member and is interested in knowing what's going on, I think that's a, a safer uh, place to be in than some official role that you're kind of judging a project officially. So I think I think that makes sense to me. Other comments, Commissioner Nielsen. Um, with that, are we um, then are we limited? Are we still limited into in the number of commissioners that do attend? Under under the Brown Act, we are not. As long as we don't talk to each other, uh, there's nothing. Staff doesn't want us to be there. I think they would recommend that we not be there in a quorum. But legally, as long as we don't talk to each other and we just come as members of the public to listen, um, the Brown Act is very clear. Um, and maybe this will come out, come back when we get the Brown Act discussion. Uh, that that provision of the Brown Act that says a quorum of a decision-making body can go to a public meeting as long as they don't talk to each other and don't, because the whole purpose of the Brown Act is that a public body not make decisions outside of the public meeting. So the, you know, the if we're all sitting around chatting to each other, the perception is, well, what are these guys doing? 
But if we're just sort of sitting in the audience listening to um, other speakers, um, then that's, we're clearly not making a decision. So especially if we don't have our smartphones right. out. No so <laughs> so I, I think there isn't really a problem with uh, a quorum of the commission attending. And, and frankly, from my perspective, um, there may be a meeting I'd want to go to, but uh, you know, most of the time, I'm, I, I prefer to wait till the project comes before the, uh, before the commission in an official way. So, um, so um, with, um, with your motion, d does that also take away the need to formally introduce those commissioner, any commissioner that does show up and the name tag? Yes. Yeah. Because there's no we official capacity. We would be there as members of the public. As mem members of the public only. And this is a recommendation to the yeah. council because we don't have the ability to change the policy. Mr. Greenberg? Um, on that point, um, you know, we might want to make recommendations. I think there was an issue in one of the previous communications from the public of, you know, which led to the desire for people to be identified that comments were being made in an unofficial, without the person knowing that this person was a, uh, a commissioner. And so we might want to make recommendations about listening, you know, this issue of like what the decorum and what we actually do, even if we go as uh, members of the uh, members of the public that we're still potentially going to be identified or, you know, if, if we're not identified, whether or not that means we wear a name tag, what we do or don't say, the issue of listening um, and insofar as we speak, if we are going to speak that, you know, we make it clear where, you know, why we're speaking. Might be sure, useful. Conway? Yeah. Um, so I think it is clear that this is the slippery slope that we always worried it would be. Um, it also appears to be um, providing some of the vehicle that the community came up with uh, through the long process of the um, housing blueprint. Um, I am, I'm going to be voting against this recommendation, although I do appreciate where it's coming from. Um, but I do think a lot of clarification is, is needed. One thing that I would say is I think it's very inappropriate for um, planning commissioners to be in a public meeting um, about an issue that's gonna come before this body and have us not be introduced. Um, so, I mean, that's the part I probably um, disagree with the most. Um, the fact that it, that it was constituted, again, through this process, that there would be a subcommittee um, that would be named, that would have a role that was supposedly going to be clear. I think we haven't hit that note. Um, but that it would be clear that we would be introduced and that we, we really aren't there as members of the public. I don't think that, it, I think it's disingenuous to suggest that we are, we, that we can be there um, and not have a role. Um, so I think it's important to be introduced on, on that point. I'll share that I'm not in favor of the motion. Um, I'm not naive to the fact that we'll be crit criticized potentially if we were to make comments, but um, I actually believe that our job as subcommittee members or commissioners is, I believe our job is to get better projects approved or not approved if it's not a good enough project. I mean, there's by right and then there's stuff that comes to us and I think we should make it better for the community. Um, I think that Commissioner discretion, subcommittee member discretion, gets us 90% of the way there, um, past many of the concerns stated. That doesn't mean the, crit the public won't criticize us. I, not, I don't want to attempt to uh, name that path because there's nothing beyond the criticism. Um, I think that commissioners using discretion should be able to, to share some comment. And I do think you gotta worry about whether the developer receives it as like, oh, that the commissioner X said this. So you've gotta say, you've gotta qualify it by saying like, you know, I have a question or I have a comment. I realize you probably read into this that you're thinking about how to get this approved, that's your job. Um, I'm speaking for myself and it's just a question. Um, so I can't, I'm not speaking for other commissioners and I'm not telling you how I'll vote on this. I, I 
want to hesitate to guide you. Um, I mean, your words are loaded because you're one of seven votes. And I do think that there are situations when using discretion and judgment that it is appropriate for a commissioner to say something at one of these meet, some of these meetings carefully. Um, so I think I'm in minority on that, and that's fine. But I think that the process, we're working on a better process. I do think that projects like Commissioner Schifrin said, we haven't seen any of these projects come. Um, we're going back to the drawing board on something that's very early on. Uh, Commissioner Conway stated some of the background and reiterated the intent. I think this has a lot of potential. Um, and I think it's um, a potential for good, potential for bad outcomes and um, questioning by the public if we don't operate carefully. And we've seen some missteps on that. But I would actually, I, I, would, I don't uh, uh, support the motion and I would actually like us to keep it and have people, I would, I would like us to not be required to be silent. I would like us to be recommended to use discretion and be mostly silent and share comments or questions, uh, what's the word, like carefully and to be announced at meetings and to have name tags and to an adhere, adhere to an approach of caution and maybe some guidance document that we give, you know, a paragraph or two that guides us a little bit if that's necessary. Um, so anyway, that's where I am on it. Chair Pepping, may I make yeah. a, a clarifying yeah. comment? So um, I believe the Pacific Front Laurel um, project that came to this group did have, uh, was did go through this process. So I just wanted to clarify that that is the one project that, that came through under this community outreach policy. Okay, that's yeah. good, thank you. And I don't remember the outreach meetings being brought up. Actually, I think the developer brought them up and said that they were useful. I don't remember comments from the public about those meetings, do any of you? That was too too late, right? I mean, it's yeah, a done, the, done at, deal. at, at this meeting, though, do you remember comments of, from the public praising or criticizing the outreach meeting? I, I don't recall that, but I will say that the that particular outreach meeting happened so far in the pro it was already so far in the process um, that I don't think that's a very good example um, to use for in terms of how this may play out. So. Um, and then I'll just add that I'm I'm actually really on the fence about like whether to s support that mo the motion that's on, that's that we're discussing right now or or not. I, I think um, the um, I, I think I, I am I am I I think I do lean more towards like st sticking with what the city council asked of and, and what ultimately what the community asked for. Um, I think we need to, I think we should continue to play it forward and see how, how this works. And I think some of the clarifying things about, you know, listening being, you know, the, the a priority um, for the, for the subcommittee, I think is, is very important. Um, and, and I was, and I was, my earlier comments were kind of my own internal struggle around what I was experiencing during those meetings and, um, but but knowing that you know it, um, knowing that I didn't want to say really say anything because you know I just didn't I, I didn't want to make that make it seem like any perception of uh, of my approval of those uh, of those projects. But um, but I, I think I guess I'm in the in the camp of I think we should continue it forward. I think um, I think the you know I think the the subcommittee members. Should I mean, I, I'm fine. I mean, the name tag thing is, you know, I, that's fine. I think the introduction is fine. I'm still a little, um, I, uh, I question um, exactly, where, you know, formally where we sit. Like, are we, or do we sit? Because in the we've we've been amongst the public um, for pretty much in, in all the ones I've been in. Um, there was this possibility of us sitting up front at a table. Like I, those are the, some of the things that I think need to be figured out as well formally, like how that happens. I don't, um, 
I'm, I, I think it's, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with sitting amongst the public as long as if there are name tags and we are introduced. And we have been introduced at every meeting, so that necessarily that hasn't necessarily been um, an issue. But um, I think name tags are a good a good thing. Um, but I would st just go back to the I would go back to the the primary um, function uh, of the subcommittee at those meetings is is to listen. I, I think that's I think that's good, and I um, I think that's the I think that's the right thing. I want to make sure I'm serving you all as chair. Um, tricky stuff, and we're uncertain about the, you know, each of us individually, and reaching toward getting group consensus is, is not crystal clear right now to me. But I also don't want to let it belab belabor this. So, um, do people have questions they want to ask before we might vote on the motion, Commissioner Greenberg? Well, I just. And Julie, did you want to say? Well, I was just going to say there is a motion on the floor, so we're not actually in the consensus building mode right now. Yeah. Well, I was trying. I'm trying to um, read the commission and see if there's consensus. Then I would just call for the vote, and I'm not sensing that. So, um, informally. Still discussing. Um, so I was going to say that, in terms of my initial question about the kind of value added and. Um, the point of Commissioner Conway about listening being what the community primarily wanted. I mean, one question that comes to my mind is the degree to which the community, such as it is, and as uh, Commissioner Schifrin pointed out, there are multiple communities, the community request that the commission participate, um, like what their understanding was of the role of our commission in the first place. Um, and, you know, so did they recognize the kinds, of th this particular subset of the community, that there could be these kinds of conflicts um, and that it could put us in this awkward position and so forth and that it could, you know, lead to other kinds of issues that we would then subsequently face once it came before us. And so there's, there's that whole kind of set of questions. Um, and if they really just wanted us to listen and to be aware of, the debate, um, then perhaps they would have wanted a uh, more, you know, a, 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 or a, um, a policy that in which we didn't speak, you know. Um, and I'm also not clear on the benefit of our speaking. I mean, I don't quite understand if it's really about land use and we're re and we're being restricted to speaking about land use why the staff can't answer land use questions or you know why if and if it's not a design review committee and we're not speaking about design issues like what you know why we would want to speak um and i also feel that and this is a point i raised last time that there's the potential to feel that the the commission as a whole once it does come before us you know if i don't go to this community meeting and this sub committee has gone and said certain things and I'm not entirely clear on what they've said or how the things that they've said has been interpreted and then that is another kind of issue that comes before the commission at the point of the decision that it kind of undermines us as a body or complicates our role as a body like we're not in a position let's say Commissioner Spellman makes a point at a meeting and you know it could be kind of another commissioner might have another view on that but they weren't at that meeting you know so um, so I feel like it's a kind of, um, it's a can of worms in a way that um, I don't know that it's even necessary if in fact all we're supposed to be doing is listening, you know? Um, and so either I would, I mean, so I continue to support this motion insofar as I think we all can go in good faith and try to listen at these meetings. Um, I guess I would say if it's, if it's not gonna be something we support that we consider another motion that, that clarifies listening. So I'm gonna um, ask for a roll call vote. Commissioner Schifrin? Yes. Conway? No. Spellman? Yes. Nielsen? No. Greenberg? Yes. Epstein? No. The motion doesn't pass. Um, invite uh, motion or 
Well, could I ask a procedural question? I'm trying to remember the bylaws on what happens when there's a, a tie vote. Now, under some circumstances, the item comes back. I'll take a look. I actually don't know off the top of my head, but you know, I, I can don't take have a quick my look. Yep. No, I can bring them up right now. Sure. I think certain kinds of projects, it comes back. Certain, it's, it's, mm -hmm. It doesn't pass, but that doesn't mean that it necessarily goes away forever. So I think we should get that clarified. Right. I'm expecting someone to make another motion, and we we can potentially still advance this tonight. Right. Mr. Conway? Um, I'm not ready to make another motion, but um, I do think that um, our the point of this discussion really was um, for us to have a discussion. Um, and we know that this is a new policy. Um, it was conceived with some good intentions and may not be hitting the mark. Um, isn't one of the things that we're doing um, really sending this discussion back for further consideration? Because what we're recognizing is it's a policy that needs some more work um, and that this subcommittee needs some more guidance. So uh, are you suggesting that we um, would request the council to review the policy and provide more guidance on um, what the role of the planning commission would be in the community outreach meetings? Yeah, I, what, what I'm suggesting is that we, we were asked to consider it and we're providing feedback to staff who is going to be making, bringing this conversation forward. I wasn't clear if um, out of this there was going to be, um, you know, strictly speaking, a recommendation for a new policy, but it was going to be a refinement of, of a policy. Well, I, I mean, it's not I'd be happy. It's a land use policy is what I was meaning to say. Right, but I'd be happy to just um, uh, make a motion to refer the uh, issue of clarification of the Planning Commission's role mm -hmm. to the City Council for their consideration in terms of um, sort of clarifying what that role is vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis these community meetings. So I'd make that as a motion. I think in the end, this is something that the council should uh, discuss in terms of, you know, there, we've heard different perspectives on what the, you know, what the appropriate role is. And I think we'd all agree that it's complex. And so um, I think it might be useful to have the council hear about some of that complexity and decide, this is what we want, let's keep it, let's change it this way. Um, they gave us this task, uh, let them uh, figure out whether this is, now that we have some experience, we've heard different points of view, uh, <laughs> let them um, decide whether this is what they want. So I would move that we um, refer this, uh, the issue of the role of the Planning Commission and the community outreach meetings to the City Council for clarification on what that role, what uh, what the commission's role should be based on the issues brought up in our discussion. And I have an answer for you on the tie votes. I will second that motion. Okay, can we move on this? Um, I think we can. Based on what you're finding? Yes, so, um, well, what this says is that on page 13 of article six, section six, um, tie votes, a tie vote during the absence of one or more members or when there is a vacancy on the Planning Commission, shall cause the item to be automatically continued to the next meeting. Automatically, so we cannot move on this, is that right? That's right. So we can't entertain this motion, based on that reading? According to a strict reading of this, yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, um, and this meeting is continued. Sorry, I brought up the bylaws question. <laughs> <laughs> this meeting is... So, I, hang on a second. Um, so um, the on on the automatic. So we ha we have a tie vote, we and we have a recommendation for essentially a replacement motion um, that would allow this matter to go to the next step, mm -hmm. to come to a conclusion, rather than circle the drain again. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I didn't, you know, I I wonder if there is a path for that, or if you'd be interested in that, Andy. Uh, I am. The, uh, it doesn't see, I don't know whether we have, uh, what kind of option we have, whether it's possible to
to reconsider the motion that um, failed on a tie vote mm -hmm. and thereby um, nullify the necessity of continuing continuing it to the next meeting. So um, it would have to be someone who <laughs> voted in favor of the motion that would have to ask for reconsideration. So there is a caveat on the tie vote. It says that except that as to matters on which action must be taken on a date prior to the next meeting, a tie vote shall constitute a denial of the requested action. Yeah. That doesn't apply. Here. No, that doesn't apply. So I think what you're saying is someone who was in favor of the first motion could ask the maker of the motion to reconsider and put, bring a new one forward. I mean, the only reason to do that is would be that our next step really requires feedback, mm -hmm. um, you know, from the council. Um, we, we haven't achieved, you know, that would be the theory of that. In the absence of, um, um, in, in the, in the context of, you know, the fact that there seems to be some consensus here, um, I would um, be happy to move that we reconsider the uh, previously, the previous motion to um, to re request the council to rescind the policy. Sagan, you're moving to reconsider that motion. We can, and what does that mean? Vote on it again? Yeah, well, I, I would. Uh, Back up from the vote? Can we do that? Yes, and so I have a um, some language here, if you're interested. So motion to reconsider. A motion to reconsider any action taken by the council may be made only on the same day that the action was taken. The motion may be made either immediately during the same session or at a recess or adjourned session on the same day. With the exception of the presiding officer, the motion may be made only by a council member who previously voted in the majority on the item, which is the subject of reconsideration. A motion to reconsider is debatable. Okay, you moving to <laughs> reconsider? Yes, not that I was in the majority, but <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll put that aside for the time being. <laughs> um, well, you weren't in the minority either. I wasn't That's in the right. minority, That's right. right, good way of framing it. <laughs> So I would move that we reconsider the motion to uh, in the previous mm -hmm. the previous motion. Is there a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So I would propose a substitute motion, which would be to uh, refer this issue to the city council. Um, to clarify the role of the Planning Commission in the community outreach policy um, in order to provide guidance to the, to the commission based on the uh, issues that were brought up at the, uh, our meeting tonight. And I'll second that again. Any discussion? Just wondering, um, if the, is there going to be like a summation of all the points that would be shared? The with staff the, is actually pretty yeah. good. Okay. I, I've seen from yeah. limited minute, minutes I've seen of okay. sort of reflecting the commission's discussion. So, yes. you know, I, it, this is, um, I think, the uh, uh, assistant there was uh, hopefully taking good notes and okay. that will be reflected in our minutes and reflected <laughs> in the matter going before the, you know, when, it, when it's, before and the it's council. Being recorded, I suppose. Right. Okay. Any dis any other comments? I'll share that I I don't support the motion. I think council has told us, uh, given as you pointed out, Commissioner Schiffer and council has given us a task, and we should do the task, and we should go back for questions after doing the task a little more. Um, I think we're slowing things down and getting in the way of work, so I won't support it. Questions? I, I, well, I just have a question. Um, so, uh, the, the committee uh, subcommittee stays in effect, I guess, until yeah. until city council has, and if we were to recommend this, that city council um, re revisits, right? So I think correct. Even if we move to end the subcommittee, it would stay on until yes, not us. until not city us. council approves. Yeah. On that. Yep. So all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? That's me.
So the motion passes 5-1. Thank you for shepherding you. us through that. Um, that ends the general business agenda item. Any um, general business agenda section, any information items? Uh, yeah, so I have one. So on January 17th, 2019, um, the 1720 West Cliff Drive project came forward. Um, it was appeal of the zoning administrators, uh, administrators approval of a coastal design and heritage tree removal permit to construct a two-story single family dwelling and detached garage on a vacant substandard parcel. Um, that has been appealed and will be going forward to the, um, uh, it's been appealed to city council will be going forward on the 326 meeting. So just an FYI, it's been further appealed. Thank you. Any subcommittee or advisory body oral reports? <laughs> Terry. Sure. Is that another question? Do you know if we have uh, business at the next meeting? Uh, I don't know. Um, we were, uh, we haven't advertised anything. There are no matters on the tentative planning project schedule. It was being held open in the event this body continued something from this meeting. Um, Just don't that do the that, April 4th? then probably not. Is that the April 4th meeting that you're referring to? And I will be gone from that meeting. Sure, sure. We'll also be gone. gone. I'll be gone too that day. Could have a I'll quorum. You'll be gone? Uh -huh. We don't have a quorum for April 4th, so. I was under the impression that the mitigated negative declaration for segment seven of the rail trail was gonna be at that meeting that I guess now is not possible to have. So what, is there a schedule for that? The last time uh, I prepared the tentative schedule for the managers, it was, uh, I believe, on the 18th of April. Mm -hmm. I did want to ask about items for future agendas, and maybe it would be on the 18th. The city council at their March 12th meeting referred the general plan annual report and the corridor plan and the, um, the golf club drive general plan policies to the commission for review. So um, when is the, is that, when is that going to come before the commission? So it will be coming. Um, we are working through our resource allocation right now in terms of staffing and are determining right now kind of what we'll need to move or when, when we'll be able to bring that. So we'll be able to have more information for you at the upcoming meeting. <coughs> okay. Uh, and then we've sort of talked at times about design review, uh, a design review commission and, um, I would appreciate it if we could get a staff report on what the you know the options are or what the status is of considering uh, establishing a design review committee. Uh, I think there are some you know we from some members of the public that that would be a desirable thing. Um, I think it could be helpful to the commission to have uh, design review input through projects coming through. Um, I, I hear that it, it's suggested, but it never gets acted on. So um, I'd like to get it on the agenda. So if the commission wants to make a recommendation on a design review commission to the council, we're able to do that. Um, so uh, if there's no objection, I would ask that that be referred to uh, a future meeting so that we could. Mr. Conway. Well, I was just going to make the point about how things get onto this agenda. Um, it doesn't generally come from commissioners, although what is true is that that process of design review committee, what you've heard us talking about is there was significant um, discussion about that while the um, zoning update was, was being discussed. Um, and um, I'd understood that it was going to come back with that. It sounds like that is coming. Uh, frankly, I wasn't here for that, and I'm not sure I would have to check back uh, on that, but I'd be happy to do that. So, so maybe that's all I'm asking is that as a new member, I'd like to get a report on what the status of the design review proposal is. Be happy to do that. Thank you. Any other items for future agendas? Nothing from, from this meeting. Any? I don't think we're carrying anything forward. Okay. Yeah. Um, and with that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.